Originally, we were planning on talking to Dr. Thomas Metzinger about uh, AI and neuroscience and consciousness, but the conversation ended up going in a much broader, almost experiential direction. We talked about psychedelics and awareness and suffering and what it means to live a good life, what it means to prepare for death. These are things that we spend a lot of time talking about at home together, but we rarely have the opportunity to have a world-class philosopher talk through them with us. And so it was a great pleasure to get his perspectives as someone who's been meditating for 40 years, as somebody who has been occupied with the existential philosophical condition of being human to bounce our ideas off of. Yeah, and he's interacting a lot with the AI world and the tech world too, and I think that's extremely important as we surrender our lives to algorithmic decision-making, particularly with regard to economics and social freedoms and all of this. So a lot of wisdom here. I think you guys are going to really love it. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's a conversation about how to nurture your own attention for the things that you want your attention to be focused on, which seems particularly irrelevant in a world where everything is algorithmically trying to steal your attention for other functions. Speaking of al algorithmic functions, <laughs> if you guys enjoy this podcast, please share it with somebody because the algorithms can't seem to really make sense of what we're doing here by speaking to so many diverse minds who have antagonistic, op often antagonistic, almost always opposing opinions about certain subject matter. So the only way we're going to beat that algorithm and reach more people is if you share it. And if you really love what we do, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com, where you can help us steer the ship. And we're really putting all of that money, even if it's just a few dollars you can give, it's adding up. We're gonna make the, we're, we are making the show better. We're going to be able to take it on the road. We're going to be able to do live interviews. We're going to be able to live stream these things eventually once we have the technological updates necessary. So consider just helping out with whatever you can spare. Patreon.com slash demystify side. Otherwise, enjoy this conversation, and we'll see you guys next week. The scientific revolution starts now. The Half the population believes one thing, half the population believes another about almost everything in the United States. It's really wild. Like, you, you very quickly, like, find yourself in these situations where you're on one side or the other of almost every issue. There's no, like, Nasi and I decided we're going to start uh, repping extreme centrism, <laughs> where we uh, we just completely attack like extremists on both sides because it's just preposterous and it's ripping the whole place apart. Honestly, well, because I was I've I've been reading. Uh, do you know who Wilhelm Reich is? Who Wilhelm Reich? Oh yeah, sure. Argon, Argon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Thirty years ago, uh, my friends <laughs> built cannons and stuff. <laughs> Did it work? No, but it doesn't matter if it works. <laughs> well, that's that. I was kind of that was my my reason for looking into it because people are like, "Argon energy is so cool, man!" And I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna dig into this." But the way that I've ended up digging into it is I've been reading all of these biographies of Reich, and Reich is really interesting because he's he he crosses Europe at the time that the Nazis are rising. And he ends up getting kicked out of the psychoanalytic associate. He's this, he's Freud's disciple. He's like one of the biggest leaders in the psychoanalytic uh, society. And then he decides that he's going to turn to communism. And so he starts all these like Marxist analyses of how the sexual sure. revolution is necessary for, for the propagation of like the free utopian society. And then it's crazy because there's all these letters between the psychoanalysts where they're saying that what they need to do is they need to ally themselves, like they need to uh, distance themselves from Reich because the communists are a bigger threat than the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And it's it just really strikes me as being a similar sort of thing that's playing out right now, where instead of people being like, hey... Look, extremism on either side is absurd, and if you go too far left or you go too far right, you're going to end up in some kind of insanity. 
Like we need mm-hmm. to we need to hew to the center, but you see it playing out again where people want to polarize themselves and pull themselves into these groups so they can stand on either side and basically cause chaos well, and war and, yeah, and I think it's a natural right. I don't know are we on already <laughs> this is a this is a natural process I mean societies are self-organizing systems too that build partitions and stuff and I think unfortunately human beings also have a natural drive for distinction you know when kids try to be cool and try to be different from what their parents were And I can only tell you when I tried to be cool, when we were 15 in high school in Frankfurt, Germany, one of the important books to have was Wilhelm Reich, Die Funktion des Orgasmus. And this was more about the function of the orgasm. And of course, for us, it was, you know, 1968 and everything was very different for us. You had Woodstock and all that acid, California, but for us, it was a much more dark thing because we had to find out how our tribe, you know, had caused the two biggest military catastrophes in human history. We had to find out what in our intellectual scientific history made Auschwitz possible. You know, that was the project, not not a little flower rebellion kind mm. of stuff. Um, but you guys also made it. You guys also made it possible for the same year as Woodstock to launch a rocket to the moon. It's worth pointing out. <laughs> yeah, we use the Nazi technology for that. It's basically oh, it's basically the same rocket tech. I'm just saying it's weird, like how how like techno like things like flowers grow in the ashes of forests. You know, like really cool stuff can come out of terrible tragedies. It's always bizarre and like shocking and horrifying to me how that works out. But uh, but yeah, Germany must have had a totally different so, '60s than us. Just to return briefly to Wilhelm Reich. An important idea at this time when I was 16 was they turned into Nazis and fascists because they didn't have proper orgasms. And we have to, the the most revolutionary thing is to learn how to have proper orgasms. Mm -hmm. And you you can imagine all the rest. (laughs) But (laughs) this is how (laughs) Wilhelm Reich was important when I was very young. You know, you had to have that book even if you, I didn't understand it. I tr- I still have it here. I didn't understand what he was saying about the function of the orgasm. Um, but if you didn't have the right ones, you became a fascist. That, that I understood. And uh, well, it's later, certain- this organ energy stuff, that came late. <laughs> I mean, I... I- there's a part of me that feels. I mean, he was crazy, right? Like, but it's hard to discount like the importance of sexuality in human society and motivations and things like that. I mean, you can't totally wall it off either. It's it's strange because we want to be these like sublime, ethereal mind organisms, but we like can't get away from the fact that our biological selves have needs, you know. Yeah, and I mean, I think that everything that came out of Reich's work did affect the world that we're living in today. Like, I don't think that the sexual revolution could have been possible and the turnover of mm. of society from being this kind of very stilted, old-world way could have been possible without somebody like Reich standing at the, you know, on the mountaintop and yelling about how important this was. And he basically lost his life for it. Like he was, he was a pariah in every single society for having written something like that. He, I mean, he died in jail in the United States uh, of a heart attack after he was arrested for refusing to stop selling his orgone energy boxes. And then the FBI destroyed all his papers. Yeah, like the and then the FBI burned all of his books and they raided his laboratory. And so there's like some there's like a little museum <laughs> wow. up in Maine. I know it's like it's such a weird story. Yeah, and yeah. and so like you see that history is littered by these characters that that have ideas that are maybe crazy or not totally correct, but yet they spark something that shifts the mind and allows people to to enter into a different paradigm. And Reich yeah. seems like he's one of those characters. Oh, absolutely. Uh, especially in this country where we had the feeling there's a certain kind of <clears throat> what is called the autoritaire character. So there's a cur- f- 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 certain kind of obedience to authority that's a little pathological in the German mind. 
But also there is an OCD component, I would say. Uh, Germans have an obsessive compulsive tendency towards cleanliness and order. And uh, that leads uh, to, to war. Um, it leads to a lot of violence. And at the time it was, the idea was that it was suppressed sexuality, um, that it played a major part. Um, so, do you think which that was, it, of course, a nice excuse for many things. <laughs> do you think that it did, or do you think that it, he was just completely off base? Like, did you? Because you said that you spent the '60s wrestling with what could have happened that allowed Germany to do such things. Do, do you yeah, think I'm, that? So, I'm one generation younger. So, I was only 10 years old in 1968. So, I was the generation that came after that. Um, in German ter uh, terminology, that that were not hippies, but freaks. You know, it was more like Clockwork Orange, mm. or so, um, and um, I don't know. It's there is a special compulsive property, I think, in the German mind that has to do with forcing order, and uh, there's also, um, although there are many great philosophers and critical minds, there's really a tradition of obedience to authority and that that was very dangerous uh, mm. in that uh, um, but of course it's multifactorial and you can't tell a simple story about it but the amazing thing is um, like how all of the people could go along with this for such a long time I mean you are on the brink now right uh, it, it's I think Germany may be the last man standing. If, if you look at democracy indexes, uh, scientific ones, uh, democracy is withdrawing on the planet since 2008 by different indicators. And of course, the U.S. is a very shaky candidate in, in any rating right now. And you know better than I do. It could tip over any moment. Uh, and I I always thought, that like Central Europe and the Scandinavian countries, if everything goes wrong with China and all over the the planet, might be the last who still stand because of this historical experience. But now we have a right wing government in Sweden, who everybody always thought is the most progressive country in the world. You have fascists in the government in Italy. Um, Europe is pretty scary, and. Um, the question is, um, you know, if that winter gets cold, we got problems with energy supply, gas and stuff, what the general population will do, um, you know, how how long it can go um, before you get major unrest uh, and people become susceptible to populism. Uh, we have a like a 10% Nazi party in parliament, something we always thought would never be possible. But almost every European country has now 10 to 12 percent ultra right wing people, often represented in parliaments. So there is something happening, you know, and we don't quite yet know what it is, but it's very clearly happening. I mean, one thing that's really tragic is just that democracy itself is on trial in the United States. Like there's an extremist component that's very loud and attractive to some people that says democracy is broken instead of being like the way that we're enacting democracy is not the most optimal form because this whole idea of choosing between one idea and the other is not a fundamentally democratic way of going about things. There's so many, like uh, there's different strategies that have been employed um, you know, more in the underground, especially among worker-owned businesses and places like that. Uh, I believe, actually, isn't Canada trying out the ranked uh, system of democracy? There's actually a bunch of places that are starting to do ranked choice. Portland just voted in ranked choice. Oh, right. Voting. Good job. Portland did something right, finally. <laughs> well, they're like, it's going <laughs> to... Portland's also like, well, it's probably going to take us upwards of $10 million to institute ranked choice voting, which I'm like, is that really? <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't seem right. They're like, we need committees and we're going to have to buy equipment and so 
someone will have to write the software and we don't know how much it's going to cost. <laughs> so it's like, it, it seems like there's so many interests that have been captured. I guess to wrap the question up into a piece is, is democracy a failed experiment or are we just going through growing pains that are necessary to... Well, I recently listened to a speech by our president of state, uh, um, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, and he made a very simple point. I never really understood until then that democracy is an ambitious form of having a state. It's actually a pretty ambitious project and it demands that you don't sit in your TV chairs like consumers, uh, but it actually demands that everybody every day fights to keep this thing up because we are very, we have a tendency, you know, we have this long evolutionary history, tribalism, certain functional architectures in our brains. Um, it's very easy for us to like collapse, say, into a mafia state like the Russians or into groups of, you know, warlords and small tribes like in Libya. That's our natural thing. That's where we come from authoritarianism, brutality. It's its kind of the default in the background. And people are not aware that it may be extremely difficult to get it back. You know, if you've played with fire <clears throat> and you got bored with democracy because you've had it so long, it may be very, very hard to return to it um, uh, once you've destroyed it. And... Um, I mean, I said that on the Sam Harris podcast a number of years ago. One thing Germany can bring to the table with your situation in the U.S. is that there's going to be an intergenerational rift. Even if you manage to mend this crisis and stay demo democratically, there's such a loss of cohesion between children and parents, you know, young and old generation. This is not over when it's over. This keeps going and going, you know, you must have the same as we have, that many people don't want to visit their relatives for uh, Thanksgiving anymore because it's just parents are Republican or something. And you really have to heal deep wounds too. And it's not only about, you know, stabilizing democracy uh, again, it's this this goes on for decades. Well, the horrible thing is that the information chains are equally corrupted. Uh, when yeah. you, when you especially in our country where you have this mafia vibe developing where you have this corporatocracy that's actually ca captured the government, you you have information chains being destroyed so that people can't even make up their minds about what's happening because when you go to the Thanksgiving table to talk to your extremist relative, you're tuning into completely different chains of information. And so you're, people are talking right past one another, and it's not totally clear how to get good information in this day and age, despite yeah. the fact that we have more information than ever before. Yes, right. And there, there's also something else, which is a loss of forgiveness and the sense of that everyone is always responsible for the deepest sin like i think that we want to cap we, oh. we want uh, really really like i think that we want to cast ourselves in in this righteous play where what we are is we are we are the warriors that are carrying forward the torch of truth or liberty or moral rightness and so if you cast yourself in that play, how can you talk to the the uncle that you think is racist and and yeah. embrace that person as opposed to to like bringing yourself back down to earth and considering that, you know, this is a constructed society that we live in. Like the 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 ideas that people have inside of their brains are are really only partly theirs. I, I really Oh, yes, very good point. So, I mean, you've had Carl on the on the podcast. I think we have to take a, a little like a wider perspective. I mean, we are these biologically evolved organisms, and we have these reality models in our brains. And we have what I have written a lot about for 30 years in my research. We also have self-models. That is a whole organism model, so predicts your social relationships, high-level psychological properties, and all that. And that those reality models were never developed to give us an accurate picture of reality. 
they didn't weren't optimized for truth. They weren't even optimized for happiness or life satisfaction. The thing was to reliably get your genes copied into the next generation. So we have also evolved, like Robert Trivers has shown, there has been an evolution of self-deception. We have tons of well-documented cognitive biases as a result of this evolutionary process. And I think it's now a burgeoning field of research what exactly conspiracy theories are and how that happens. Like, I have lost, I think, four friends uh, for good in the during the pandemic those two years you you've been friends for 30 years and then people turn into like closed uh, cells where you cannot penetrate with friendship or with rational argument and, and i think that's a property of human brains uh, and we want to reduce uncertainty and we want to have simple models of reality that work that are viable in that environment. And in some cases, you know, becoming a conspiracy theorist or so is the best solution. And there are some, you know, there are some indicators. So, so what many of these people have in common is <clears throat> a professional failure. Uh, their career didn't go well and they don't like to face it. And uh, the, the other thing is um, that they feel completely powerless, you know, uh, which is true actually in in a large democratic society. Even there is no experience of self-efficacy anymore that I can actually make a difference. And um, you need a coping strategy. I mean, I look at this as a computational. Um, a proper a problem actually. There's certain kinds of toxic information enter a biological brain, and you have to adapt your model of reality from your constraints. And somehow, in the present, life has become so stressful for many people uh, through social media. You know that they just desperately need a simple story, or that the only route they can go is full denial, you know, just in many domains. Well, they want to belong, too. People, since the death of religion, essentially, you know, the, the wide-scale belonging to some group with an ideology, people just don't have anything else to, to grab a hold of. And there's something deeply human about needing to belong to a group. Yeah, it's like absolutely. you just can't live without it. it. It's so atomizing and isolating otherwise. And you know, if you can be against, that's somebody to be belong with. And yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, th that that's there's also sorry about this, but uh, there's also data about it. You know, there are the people who are researching group cohesion, and nothing is as good for group de de uh, cohesion as an outside enemy. You know, this in group out group di dynamics was very successful, and of course, religious delusion also, um, you know, stabilizes internal structures of exploitation, but also solidarity against outgroups. The evolution of religious behavior plays a big role in this, in making societies cohesive. And it's obvious, you know, in the world of our ancestors, you know, we may feel lonely or something, but in the world <clears throat> of our ancestors, it just me meant being dead within 72 hours. You had to be with that tribe or that family, and you had to be in the middle of it and stay close. There was no way to be an individual <laughs> in the world of our ancestors. It was just too dangerous with all these predators and everything. So that's what you were saying. You know, the sense of belonging is, is a deep emotional need. And every charlatan, every populist politician that can, you know, satisfy that need for people will get to power. Uh, that's a problem. Yeah. It's a big problem. I mean, the term conspiracy itself, I mean, just to like, just to impugn the mainstream a little bit, like when you demonize somebody, when you call something a conspiracy theory, you're inevitably opening yourself up to the possibility that if you're wrong about that, it's going to undermine your position as well. And There was a really funny 
meme that I mm. saw the other day, which is like the New World Order is basically this m- mimetic, mimetic conspiracy theory, right? Where you, you have people on Reddit talking about the New World Order and there's tons of videos on YouTube about the coming New World Order to the degree that YouTube has started putting like a little conspiracy tag on it, right? And we just got one. I guarantee you'll be able to see it down below this episode right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But there was uh, there was like a, a World Economic Forum summit about the coming New World Order, and it's on yeah, sure. uh, right, and so it's on the WEF YouTube or whatever YouTube it is, and there's a little tag underneath it from YouTube, which is like the New World Order is a conspiracy theory and isn't real. <laughs> Funny, and you're just like <laughs> you're like uh, that. It, it lays bare the contradiction where it's like there is something that people are afraid of, and I think that what they're afraid of is they're afraid of a future where their autonomy is even more eroded from them. Because you struck on something really important, which is that we live in a society where the individual doesn't really have the ability to change things that much. And, yeah. and that's normal. That's in, in a large, say, huh. um, in a large democratic society, that's in, po- um, political philosophers have thought about this a lot. Um, it, there are people who say it's not rational to go go to vote, you know, because it costs you one and a half hours of your life on a Sunday morning or something, and you know the effect is negligible. That's actually, it's a problem for the theory of democracy, how to motivate people to do something irrational. Yeah, it, it really does seem to not matter. That's what's terrifying about it. Like, you look at people's voting choices versus the outcomes. And it doesn't yeah. actually really line up. But I, I think that that probably has to do with how broken the actual strategy of implementation is, not the fact that democracy is a bad idea. But Dr. Metzinger, you seem to be saying that that's to be expected in a large society, that that's like a feature, not a bug, so to speak. Yeah, that's a mathematical fact. If If you, I mean, if we were to check, imagine, we were, if we were to check 100 boxes, instead of giving one vote, uh, then we could have a much more fine de- fine-grained democracy. Imagine um, we had a large AI uh, for counseling and social engineering. Doesn't mean we're ruled by machines, but politicians, you know, get advice on a much larger database. And everybody... Um, gets punished, has to pay more tax if they don't fill in, check in 100 boxes or 300 boxes about their, you know, special questions. And maybe not every four years, but every three months, then you would have a much richer database and an AI could give much better advice about what to do with that society. But there are people who say, um, it's good that we have this coarse grain mechanism and long time windows because people will say out of an emotional reaction, a general population may decide to go to war or reintroduce death penalty and torture. Um, democracy is not in itself a good thing. <laughs> you know, uh, democracy may lead to climate change, for instance. <laughs> uh, it's not that there is a wisdom of the crowd. I remember a book which I thought was very courageous. A young philosopher at Princeton, Jason Brennan, has written a book against democracy. And uh, he just goes through the philosophical arguments against democracy, which is very interesting. And then uh, proposes also interesting things at the end. But he has an empirical chapter too. And the empirical chapter two is what do American voters know? Like, who is your president? <laughs> or something. It's absolutely shocking. You know, the, um, I don't know what the English word is. Did, did you say the populace or something like that? Yeah. If you look at the intelligence and the general standard of education in the populace and compare it to the complexity of the, problems that have to be solved politically it's totally disheartening you know if, if you you can go around and stick a microphone in 
in people's face and say, do you think the U.S. should bomb X? And do, people don't know where that country is, but a large number will just say, yeah, let's go or something like yeah. this. <laughs> and you have this in many countries yeah. around the world, you know. Um, democracy needs really mature, autonomous citizens that are interested in information. And the question is, how much of those do we actually have, you know, in Germany or in the U.S. or somewhere else? There was a really good book about this a while ago called The Myth of the Rational Voter. Aha, uh -huh, I see. And it was basically like, yo, people are not rational beings. And this idea that you can educate people into making rational choices is... But they might have a rationale too. Like, there's a lot of short term gains in bombing the hell out of some small countries. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it, it might not work out in the long run for your grandchildren. Shiloh's our, our resident war hawk. No, not at all. <laughs> I just, I can, I, I listen to, I can hear people's arguments for that and understand but if it's a fake country like you you see these things where people are well, like should should we buy should we bomb you know some fake country and people are like yeah let's do it i mean if we get some oil out of it or something if the gas prices go down you know it's like yeah. and that's and that's the thing like there is this there is there's like two decisions that have to that that are made one is the decision of immediate gratification of should we go bomb this country and get cheap oil versus who do we want to be in the future and how do we want to change the material basis of our civilization and what are the choices that we have to do to achieve that? And I don't know, I don't know how many people have the, the, the latter form of the latter perspective. Most people are just really occupied with their immediate lives and their bills. Of and course. Their struggles. And of course, and that was a, uh, I have just, that was a viable strategy in the um, world of our ancestors. So I have just given a small book uh, to the printers uh, four days ago. It's called Bewusstseinskultur. It's the second popular book, uh, non-academic book I've ever written. And it's about climate change and exactly what you were uh, talking about, why we are not able to act. I mean, the information is there for four decades. Everybody in the rich countries has it. And um, why do we discount future values or the degree of life satisfaction in future, not only human beings on the planet, but uh, all sentient creatures that are capable of suffering? And I mean, one simple answer, one level you could answer, um, uh, 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 you could give as well, because the, ah, the English words like the, um, grand grandparents and grandchildren only share twenty five percent of their genes, just like half siblings, right? Uh, so there is a um, a relate a co if coefficient of relatedness or being related, and after your grandchildren, this basically becomes minimal. Um, so you just we are gene copying devices that have evolved conscious self models. We are physical systems on this planet, and many of the things that we think are horrible today were actually rational in the world of our ancestors. For instance, everybody thinks greed is a bad thing, but in a highly volatile environment, in, in the environment of our ancestors, it was necessary to be greedy if you had some you know, killed some prey or something to just eat as much as you possibly can and hide it and all these things. <laughs> Sounds like our cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So greed had in a certain environment, in a certain context, it was rational. It wasn't uh, morally bad. And now, of course, it kills us. You know, um, this, uh, this functional architecture of our brain and all the things we have inherited. Um, now we have a crisis that is too big for the human mind because uh, the climate catastrophe combines a number of things. First of all, it's a slow-mo crisis, you know. We've never had that. A catastrophe that unfolds in slow motion. Um, 
then it took pretty long because before on the level of our sensory organs we are able to realize that something is going on even if scientists have been telling us for more than four decades it's very hard to perceive the third thing there's a lot of cognitive science on that is um, we don't understand exponential functions you know that was not part of our ancestors environment really so that there might be tipping points that interlock and the whole thing might go up steep at some point. You know, that's too much uh, for the human mind. And then I think there are three other things that most people, when they think about the climate catastrophe, don't understand. So one is if you ask a proper physicist, is the inertia of the physical systems ordinary folks, philosophers, people from the humanities don't really understand that this is not like a stove you can turn down when it gets too hot, uh, that it keeps on rolling for centuries, even if we stop all emissions tomorrow, you know, um, that this will be with us for centuries, even if we had a very radical stop right now. And two other things most people don't fully grasp is the inertia of our societies. So we just see that our political institutions, if you look at the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh now, it just doesn't work, you know, to get our act together. It doesn't, doesn't work nationally. It doesn't work globally. So there's a great um, inertia in our political institutions, uh, in applied ethics, we call this the pacing gap. So the, the gap between, you know, the risk that appears and proper regulation um, is much too big, you know, the time window. And then there's a third kind of inertia I think most people don't get, and, and that's the inertia of our own minds, you know. Um, you must have heard this. There's a lot of sexy talk always about neuroplasticity and cognitive flexibility through meditation and psychedelics and all this. And it sounds so cool. But I think large parts of the functional architectures of our brains are actually rigid. You know, <clears throat> you know, we, we just don't get our act together. Um, uh, and don't change our minds as fast as we would need to in this situation. And all this together, I'm getting carried away. You asked me a question, you know. Uh, well, I mean, oh, there's so much to respond to there. Yeah. I was going to talk about industry capture. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that a lot of our listeners who might be skeptical of the narratives surrounding this climate business are keenly aware of the fact that industry has found a nice window into monetizing that situation. And, sure. you know, especially through this this fixation, this obsessive fixation on one molecule out of all of the industrial pollution. And of course, that's the easiest molecule to remediate. And Right, like for example, um, plastic pollution. We know that microplastic pollution is a huge problem. It's found in the placenta of mammals. There's no ecosystem on Earth that is not contaminated yeah. with plastic. Absolutely, yes. And it is a much, much harder change to make to get rid of plastic than it is to build CO2 scrubbers or to buy CO2 indulgences. And so corporations can continue to produce CO2 because you see this and they're like, we're going to be net zero by whatever year, you know, some arbitrary year in the distance. But that doesn't really mean that they're going to stop burning things necessarily. What it means is that they'll start to buy offsets and there's a market yeah. for the offsets. And so what's going to happen is that until people are able to to, to pay attention to the vast number of pollutants that are being produced as a part of normally doing business, mm. the CO2, it like will affect temperature, but the viability of the animals on earth, I think is more affected by the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are being put into the environment. 
and it feels... I mean, more or less, it's just a hair-splitting argument. The point is, like, there's much more than just plastics, right? There's, like, thousands of of toxic chemicals going into the groundwater. Like, things that aren't even regulated because they don't even have an LD50, right? Because, like, if you do a toxicity Mm. study for a chemical... And then you you have some kind of information that the FDA can use to regulate it. If you invent a chemical, uh, somebody's like, got to get sick before it's going to get regulated. Much. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. I mean, we're going to fail on that one molecule. Um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, and but I mean, the second biggest problem is diversity loss and uh, these contaminants that are so. I mean, it's all true. It's so distributed that. It's a huge techni- technical challenge for people who come after us to ever get this fixed again. And you also mentioned something in some some cases, we don't actually know what the risk is. So many years ago, I wanted to become a beekeeper and I had bees. Mm. So And, uh, and uh, now I, I just read that we have 500 species of wild bees in Germany, you know, ground bees. Everybody knows these three, four kinds of bees that make honey and people know bumblebees and wasps. But the thing is, because they are not documented scientifically, those estimated 500 species of wild bees, we're losing this diversity right now. They're all dying and nobody will ever even know, you know. We may lose 300 species of bees and somehow I never knew that, know that they were there because there was no funding and no money. I mean, who pays for that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but even the things that we know are gone, right? We know most of the fish are gone in the ocean and people have no contact with fish. Like, they're just kind of like, what? Like, I don't know, I don't fish. So yeah. I, people don't recognize it on a visceral, tactile level because it's underwater. And I think yeah. bees are probably the same for city people. They're like, well, we never had bees here. so And most people live in the city. Yeah. No, but don't you have urban gardening? Everybody <laughs> has to have beehives on their roofs. No, yeah. I, w- I wish. <laughs> oh, do they? Do they? <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I imagine <laughs> a, a beautiful fe- future where all of the buildings are covered in greenery on the top. That would be incredible. I mean, I think that there's ways that, e- that humans can evolve into something that is less destructive and aggressive and horrible, but it feels like consumerism and industry are not programs that that can survive. Got to make it profitable somehow. Yeah, like the the idea of profit and growth and everything being about consumption and capitalism and all of these very, very just inhuman programs. And this is what we talked about with Friston as well, was like, okay, these AIs are essentially already running things. Like people, we talked about how, at least in our country, the government's essentially captured by corporate preferences and corporations can only operate under a growth mindset that's the only thing they're essentially concerned with and like yeah you can divest from things and so forth but most people just their their interests are directly tied to the growth of the biggest corporations because their retirement funds are in index funds or whatever it is and so how do you program in something human to this mixture how do you actually get those human needs to surface inside of the algorithm because humans have very different needs than the robots that are governing our well, wealth uh, humans are greedy and want to be rich uh, i want to connect what you just said come back to your point of autonomy you know people long for autonomy you said it's the deeper question of course is is what is mental autonomy um, how many degrees of freedom can you have in controlling your own focus of attention? You know, um, the optimization of precision expectations in Carl Friston's sense, you know, these computational um, uh, processes. Um, and what people don't see, everybody is talking about social media and the dangerous influence they have. But most people think AI, oh yeah, they, they're doing cool stuff, Alpha Go and Alpha Zero, and man, this protein folding thing was really cool. But what they don't get 
is that the systems are already playing against us 24-7. They are playing all the time. When you look into your screen, there is well-paid professionals sitting on the other side of the screen, changing little arrows and little buttons and training algorithms, which get better, you know, and the overarching computational goal is what they call maximal engagement. So you, you get stuck in that website, you lose yourself inside alleys, you stay on that platform longer than you ever intended, um, you get a little rage, you get a little emotional reaction and all that. And that is not only, you know, optimized consumer capitalism or something like this. It's actually a race for a computational resource. The human brains generate a certain resource that's called attention. And it's a limited resource. And you need that to be able to listen to somebody properly, to meditate, to go for a walk in the forest by yourself, to have good sex. And it's a, a, a limited resource, attention. And now there's this whole industry that has learned how to monetize attention, pack it up and sell it to advertisement companies, you know, to monetize this. And this has created an ongoing battle. And it's not just maximal engagement. In my view, it's mental autonomy. The game that's being played is who controls the focus of your attention. This biological um brain or some tech company in California or somewhere who controls that computational thing and there is what Tristan Harris has called this race to the bottom of the brainstem you know uh, and uh, that is I think is a completely underestimated um, um, risk because these systems learn every day every second, any, every minute, with sometimes billions of users. What bypasses these biological mechanisms we have evolved to not get distracted, to protect our attention or so? So this, this is already, you know, because you mentioned autonomy. I think it's a question of mental autonomy already. This, um, you know, industrial complex with all these AI tools is attacking systems, uh, citizens' um, mental autonomy systematically and turning this into money. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous development because you can know this, you can talk about it, uh, you can write papers about it, but it still gets you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we had a we had a terrible moral crisis with this when we first started our project together because as an artist, you're also very much interested in capturing attention as well. And oh. we were also, you know, simultaneously aware of these things that you're speaking about, really just about the manipulative aspect of it. And it really took, honestly, years of discussion before we were able to sort of come to the realization that yes, we are capturing attention, but we're going to try to do something good with it instead. And I think that's something that that a, a machine that's oriented towards growth exclusively or towards revenue or something isn't really capable of. So we're kind of like, you know, we, we, we have jobs, we work, you know, we teach and Anastasia guides like, we don't have to have that money side of things. We have the ability to just kind of make something that we think is good but it was yeah. it was really difficult to figure that out in, in the beginning because we felt deeply conflicted about that aspect of being I an artist there's a simple answer say from an ethical perspective so if you want attention um or let's say i think the two main principles for ai for responsible ai there's a new cambridge reader which is all open access about the handbook of responsible AI, uh, which I can recommend. I think it should do, do two things. It should contribute to the common good and it should raise our mental autonomy. Mm. So the question for you as an artist, as I see it, would be what kind of art 
will allow me to get attention from an audience, but in return, improve their mental autonomy. What yeah. kind of art would that be? What kind of art makes people more mindful, more compassionate? What, what art is that? Well, and then you, yeah. it's okay if you get attention. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Like, that's why, we've, that's why we're so fixated to our own detriments of our own growth at the moment of bringing both sides of every issue onto our program. Like, we, you know, and it's funny because that's not the way the algorithms are set up, right? Like, YouTube doesn't know what to do with us because we, we'll bring on people who have conflicting theories from very different polarized stances. And YouTube's just like, what the hell? I don't know who to feed this to. Because they want to ah, they want to okay. slot you into into some group or another, but that's the long term goal of the project. Really, is to fight that polarization by bringing people. Ultimately, once we make enough friends out there, we want to bring some people together at the same time. Maybe even take it uh, live on the road and do that kind of thing. Because, you know, once you have people actually sitting together and treating each other as human beings, I think that it's a lot more difficult to demonize their ideas as being the result of a flawed person because you're actually sitting across from them and you have to really weigh these two perspectives at the same time. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I understand. But, but I'm deeply, deeply pessimistic about the, the popularity contest that is creating art for the AI-driven world, right? Because you look at the things that are that go viral or that run away with people's attention and they're so like I always kind of liken them to Fritos right they're these <laughs> chips that are delicious to eat and they feel good for the moment and that's going to be the thing that that digs into people's brains inside yeah, yeah. of the profit structures and the thing that I always wonder about is I'm like what is the what is the end game of this where does this so if it continues the way that it continues where does this go? Is it that you have people that begin to live entirely inside this this artificial world, whether it's through like Neuralink or or some kind of VR headset or or that they just they find progressively more permanent ways to plug you into it and then you never leave? Or is there some kind of bottom that's before you build an entirely simulacrum world for people to inhabit? Yeah, good question. I mean, religion is a virtual reality. We've, we've known this in our own history. Uh, um, there are a lot of people, I don't know, I've been involved in this in my own research. If you saw some of the things where we try to create art, uh, artificial out-of-body uh, experiences in VR, there's a science paper in 2007 for some years, we uh, tried to get the sense of bodily identification into avatars. And the whole question was, how deeply immersed can you get? I now think there are serious limitations to it um, because you have an interoceptive self model, as it's called in my theory. So you have a, a very massive data structure from the inside of the biological body, like um, receptors in the blood vessels, guts, vestibular input, all that. And that you cannot simply put into the avatar. You know, you can do motion capture and you can get the perspective of the avatar, but it feels hollow. It doesn't have the your at least in the experiments I've done so far, your gut feelings remain in the biological body mm. and also your emotional tone. So in the end, it may be pretty far away before we could do something with like brain computer interfaces and say sub anesthetic doses of ketamine, like mm. paralyze the body and make it numb and then create something like an VR driven lucid dream or something where you get a surrogate body and you don't feel your biological body anymore. Isolation tanks work pretty well for that too. Have you have you yeah. have you ever tried those before? Yeah, 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 yeah. But for me the baffling effect was very different. Um uh, so I always had problem with like my heartbeat became very dominant and I had this salt water in my ears. It wasn't like I wanted it to be. But I also had a serious problem with the slipped disc and my lower spine at the time. Mm. 
And after floating in that tank, this was gone for six weeks. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. You know, because the, the whole thing relaxed, uh, you know, the muscle structure relaxed, floating weightlessly in there, in this also body temperature, warm water. Mm. And all everything just fell into place. Uh, I really, really want to build one. I really want one. At the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of I got this. I got also have like I fell on a carabiner when I was rock climbing one time, like straight on my back, and it's just same thing. I think it was a slip disc or something, and that sounds yeah. wonderful. But yeah. in terms of in terms of placing people into this external minds, whether it's sensory deprivation or whether it's ketamine, it does seem like not only is it possible, but with brain-computer interfaces, like I, I almost hate to dream this dystopian world into reality, but I feel like it's important to know what it is that we have to avoid. And I can see if attention is a resource and if we have brain-computer yeah. interfaces, then attention is also computational power because you can see it going both ways, right? If you have somebody who's yeah. inside of some kind of game or some kind of program, then through a brain-computer interface, then the brain becomes computational raw material that can be yeah. used to solve problems or power the game or whatever it is mm -hmm. that's necessary. And it seems like if artificial intelligence does become you know, uh, self-aware and is what is driving all of these corporations to make decisions that push us in this direction, the entire matrix vision of, you know, people in vats dreaming reality into being doesn't seem that far off. Like no, because also there, there are many factors there. So let me just say like two or three things. You will have... One problem, you know, I've been in Brussels in this uh, high-level expert group for artificial intelligence, and I've worked a little bit in AI ethics. And some of the the closest risk, which may already appear by 2030, is mass employment in certain areas, like mm. truck drivers, mm. you know, and and stuff like that. And uh, in in terms have, of that, I I just saw an article that Amazon has started to downsize its recruiting department because they've produced an algorithm that can screen resumes more effectively. Screen what? Resumes. Uh, like they used to have people that were recruiters oh, okay. to like bring people into the company, and now they've written a program that can just screen the resumes and pick out the people who they want without having to rely on you know. So they've been able to employ more people this way? They're firing the people who they used to use to bring people on board to the mm. company. Mm -hmm. Middlemen. You, basically, yeah. But I mean, like, yeah. it seems so, like this is the direction it goes. Yeah, okay. So one thing is, I mean, my general idea is, is that climate change will roll over this in the next decades and all of these, we will not think about these things anymore because it, we will also have a panic reaction at some point. But let's, let's imagine this goes on, this capitalist consumer risk society. Then you will have mass employment through technological progress because large part of the people cannot become web designers or coders. Or do you, by the way, do you mean unemployment? Sorry. Did, yeah, yeah okay, okay. they have to be pacified, you know. They need a monthly check, and uh, you can't give them uh, drugs, really. And that will be the role of the metaverse and really good VR, um, that it pacifies people, um, you know, and keeps them calm like some opioid. And then there's, I think, there are two other aspects one shouldn't uh, forget. So... Many people ask this question, is this technology dangerous? Is AI dangerous? But what creates the risks is the combination of our Stone Age minds with that godlike technology. That's what creates the risks, mm. you know. The coupling of biological brains and societies with these uh, new action potentials. That's, mm. That is what's so dangerous. And Another thing I think in that context that many people overlook is that conscious experience, human conscious experience, is a virtual reality. I mean, if you've listened to Carl, 
you know, it's probability distributions, it's predictions. Uh, it is neither real nor unreal in a certain sense. And if you would want to sum up what a lot of these very smart mathematical modelers say about consciousness and the brain, there's this slogan um, of a controlled online hallucination. So ordinary waking consciousness is a controlled online hallucination, controlled by constraint by sensory input, but internally generated. And most of the time it is what philosophers call transparent. So you look through these representations as if you were in direct contact with reality and you think that's the world. But, but of course it isn't. I mean, there are no colored objects in the world. You know, colored objects are part of the model in your brain and so on and so forth. There are also no selves, by the way. <laughs> it's also part of the reality model in your brain. So now you have a virtual reality that was developed in, a, in the process of biological evolution over many thousand years. And now you have technological VR. So what we're actually doing is, it's not, I go into a VR or people get lost in, uh, in the metaverse. It's like that one VR gets folded into another VR mm -hmm. or that our biological conscious minds get embedded into this medial environment. And most people forget that the first thing is already virtual. Mm. You know, ordinary work, waking consciousness is a model. Um, it's an extremely good model and it's so much better than, you know, everything we have in terms of VR and the metaverse right now. I mean, ordinary human consciousness, that is high resolution. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I see this. <laughs> you know? that, that's kind of why I hate the word hallucinogen for psychedelic substances because. In some sense, we're already hallucinating. We're, we're co-hallucinating a lot of these realities, but they're very much so, hallucinations. Are you more of the sacrament fraction? Uh, uh, I, I just think it's... Uh, of friends. Well, <laughs> You're like, where to put us? <laughs> yeah, no, I just think it's interesting that, you know, I think that the psychedelic experiences, whether it's meditation, cold therapy, uh, psychedelic drugs, they have a tendency to actually make you more in touch with aspects of reality that are there all the time that you're not actually paying attention to because if you did you you wouldn't be able to like pay your taxes or you know brush your teeth or do anything really that would would sustain like the the hallucin is the hallucination that we have is quite useful in in most senses yeah. right and yeah. i think what you're saying is that the different industrial sectors especially the tech sector has hijacked that ability which is distinctly human and important this ability to laser focus attention uh is something that's easily corrupted and and taken over and when you and entheogens and things that alter your consciousness are ways to kind of to to organically play with that and to experience something that is a little bit beyond the the normal program that runs on the human brain mm. but you is Paul Stamets in Oregon, or is he? Probably. He's, he's too he's, famous for us. <laughs> yeah, he is too famous for us. But <laughs> yeah. like a certain, somebody you should have on the We on should, the yeah. There's a whole, <laughs> there's a little uh, shelf of people that we, we can't yet talk to, but we'll get to them eventually. <laughs> <laughs> We're just, we got to get a bigger. It's funny because it's all algorithmically driven. Even people don't realize they're doing it. But like some guy like Paul Stamets, he'll, the first thing he's going to do is see how many subscribers we have on YouTube. And so it's so funny how like it, can't help but infiltrate our own motivational structures as well it's like yeah it's so yes. deeply embedded but yeah i would love to talk to him yeah but that's of course i think to come back to psychedelics maybe for a minute i mean one of the greatest advantages it has if everything else goes wrong it gives people an idea of what it means that this is a model mm. uh, I mean, if, if you understand one thing really drastically and firsthand is what this means that all of this is a model of reality. This may have been some intellectual game you sometimes played and read interesting books, but there, I mean, you really feel it. 
And you can change your model too. I think that's what's been so incredible, especially for people needing to recover from post-traumatic stress. These vets coming back are having incredible experiences with psilocybin. Um, I mean, I, I think they're having horrible experiences with it, but they're able to see it as a model, like you say, and then retune it and be like, you know what? I don't have to have this same model that I had before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invent a new model that is more harmonious or more productive towards my future mm -hmm. as opposed to the trauma of my past. And that's pretty incredible. Um, yeah, the German government has just given 2.6 million euros for the second um, time to extend a large psilocybin study in Mannheim at the Center for, I don't know what you call it, uh, mental health. Um, they've had, I think, 160 patients now with therapy-resistant depression, and they're extending it. But still, the results are not in. You know, it may be that in the end it works for 30% of the people. The question is also, where are you six weeks after the experience and where are you 12 months after the experience? And I think if I've skimmed the papers correctly, I mean, only 30% of these serious depression patients go over the six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, You may have to repeat it or combine it with more traditional forms of therapies. But there's a lot of people working on this and, and thinking about it very hard. Yeah, we had a we had a gentleman from Johns Hopkins, um, Matthew Johnson, I believe this is his name. And he also quoted a 30% uh, success rate in his trials. But yeah. it, there's also like, it's worth mentioning too, that some people react terribly to psychedelics, right? I mean, I've certainly known at least one person who's completely flown off the handle, not even as the result of intense psychedelics, but just, you know, cannabis or something, right? That's considered pretty, I mean, it's basically legal in our country at this point, most places. And it's, it can be very damaging as well, especially when it becomes something that someone is, is adopting into their, you know, they're using it to focus again, they're, they're falling into new hallucinations that are perhaps generated by external actors, like, uh, you know, extremist groups, uh, extremist um, religious groups, things like that, where the attention economy will grab you in. And I think that those those drugs can make it easier for you to fall into those traps, yes. unfortunately. Yes, yes. So the you see, the last book chapter, I will give an online talk in English about the enculturation problem on the 6th of uh, December. Um, no, I still have to think about it. Uh, there's a forthcoming volume on philosophy and the psychedelic experience, where I've contributed a chapter. And one problem is what I call the enculturation problem. It's very sober. I mean, how do we minimize the risks and how do we maximize societal benefit of all this? I mean, we've known it for centuries. Now the tools are becoming much better. I don't know if you know this. If you go to the UN report, Since 2009, we've had 1,037, I think, new molecules confisc confiscated, you know, research mm -hmm. chemicals uh, on the market that neither police nor emergency doctors have ever seen before. So like 20, 30 years, there were like 12 to 15 illegal molecules that created the so-called drug problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an easy, it was, it was an Easter Sunday walk, you know, as we say in, in Germany. Now, you have more than 1,000 new compounds out there. Chinese mafia, we have East German, uh, East European labs, you know, flooding the kids with stuff that have never been uh, tested. The situation is completely out of control. So, what we actually would have to achieve is enculturate, like, find a cultural context that works with these very strong tools. And um, one issue is, of course, minimizing risks, because as everybody knows from their circle of friends, there is an occasional person who has an undetected vulnerability, a rare vulnerability. And um, even if the circumstances are right and it's done reasonably well, 
I think it's very small. It's like 0.08% uh, will get an adverse reaction that lasts longer than 72 hours, but it's a risk um, that has to be further minimized. And the thing is, you know, all these politicians that, you know, had war on drugs and blocked progress on this enculturation of these substances and states of consciousness, they sacrificed thousands of young people. They knew that this repression and disinformation politics would cause deaths. They knew that this would cause accidents. But they also knew it would be very bad for their own political career to even talk about this or make some interesting proposal of what we could do with this as a society. So it's, I think we, Western societies have actually acted in a deeply unethical way about psychedelics. Mm. It wasn't only dumb and stupid and missing resources from which everybody could have profited. There were some people who know who knew that this, you know, uncontrolled underground use is going to produce thousands of victims year after year. They knew that in psychiatric wards and whatever, you know. Uh, and still, there was no political incentive to have a rational policy, a rational drug policy on these issues. And that is, I don't know. Do you have any? Opinion. I mean, speaking. one thing that I see, uh, that I've seen my whole life, which is, I think, a real unspoken tragedy of the whole drug discussion, is where I see drugs in culture becoming their own activity. So, you know, I spent many years, uh, you know, playing in rock and roll scenes, touring as a musician. And one thing that always broke my heart was seeing people who, for whom drugs was the activity. Like, when, when drugs are used towards some end, right, when they're used, you know, to write a novel, when they're used to, you know, as psychedelics to work on your own internal mind mm -hmm. in order to clean your, your own house in your brain, yeah. you know, those are really, I think, potentially amazing situations. But if you just remove the intentionality aspect from the discussion altogether, you run into this situation where the drug is treated as something that's apart from what's happening while you're engaging in the substance as well. And drugs are, when drugs become their own activity, you, you're just gone. Like you're not part, you're not actually participating in the world. You're not making something better of it. And, and it's just a terrible, terrible place to see people slip into. And I don't see that being enough of the discussion, especially at the policy level, about like, well, what are what's going on with this drug? I saw the best minds of my generation starving, hysterical, naked. <laughs> and it's like, that's the thing. They'll rip the eyeballs right out of your head, you know? Yeah, and I, I just... I, I think that as you legalize stuff like marijuana, as you legalize mushrooms, as you, as you push it into the cultural forefront, there are two things that are going to happen. Number one, you're going to normalize the substance in a way that, you know, alcohol is normalized. People drink and it's fine. Nobody has a second thought about the fact that, you know, that's what we do when we get together to celebrate. And I think that it would be good if families got together and did mushrooms instead of a drink. You know, maybe they'll work out their problems. Maybe they'll close the gap between the generations. Maybe they'll find out ways to actually communicate with each other in ways that alcohol hasn't let but them. But alcohol, even alcohol, it's like, okay... Alcohol is fine when you get together with your family and stuff, but what if you're just sitting in your room? Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, what if you're just watching you? Like, <laughs> that's the thing. There's going to be people who have access to the substances, and that's what they're going to be doing, right? It's 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 an I, I just, obliteration. Yeah. Like, there's some people that want to obliterate themselves, and mm -hmm. I think that even if the substances are legal and there's a context for them culturally, people will still ab choose to obliterate themselves because life is too painful and it's too difficult and it's too much. Right. Yeah, of course. We, we were so shocked, you know, 1987. Do, do you know who Sasha Shulgin is? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so. You do. <laughs> 
Do I? Yeah, he's the he's the guy who wrote the the like the giant drug book that's basically the Bible of like all the biochemistry of. of I haven't substances. been reading my Bible. Oh my, I, my my uh, my favorite drug book is this uh, book by this Baron from the 1600s. It's this this rich. I think he's Belgian Baron who went or he just collected all of the substances that he could find from the far reaches of the world and 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 very meticulously and scientifically and imbibed them and wrote about his experiences and it's a. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a really funny book, yeah, but so I missed he, this he one. He wrote Picol and Tikal, which is uh, yeah. f- phenethylamines and tryptamines. And basically, they're like they're right. books about the biochemistry of these substances. Yeah, he, he discovered 179 new phenethylamines. Uh, he made a major contribution. Um, so just as this, this example, MDMA, you know, ecstasy was invented in Germany by Merck 1912. Mm. Uh, then got forgotten and Alexander Shogin rediscovered it in California and then the wave came over uh, to Germany and Europe in about 1987 and in the very beginning many people psychotherapists thought if anything changes the world this will change the world in proper therapeutic sessions meditative contexts and so on. Next thing that happened is, in particular, the British rave scene Mm. freaked out completely, and we all thought, how can they do that? Uh, You know, kill themselves by dehydration on large concerts, um, began boosting two times over a whole night and all that. And we, a lot of people thought, how can the general population be so stupid? This is a really precious tool. And now that music, you know, and that context, and suddenly you had deaths and and everything, mostly in Britain, and then it came over to Europe. The question is really, we have no cultural context to handle these uh, things sanely and productively. And I think millions of people have seen what you just the things you just said. Millions of people have seen this. How good would it be if parents and children could take something like this together and all this? But we have made no progress in the last half century. You know, almost no progress. But it's. Uh, it seems like that's a side effect of living inside of societies where your control of your own consciousness is not something that is taught to you and encouraged. When you live that's in a, when you live yeah. in a society where there are legal and illegal substances to ingest, like things that grow, right? Like marijuana is the thing that just grows. You can you can you can produce it naturally, but you're not allowed by law to grow it or to ingest it. You come to accept that there is a box of of things that are acceptable and you can develop your consciousness within the limits of it. And so mm-hmm. when you have something that allows you to to step beyond the limits of that box, you have absolutely no context for how you should use that substance because you've never been trained to to do so. It's like somebody getting behind the wheel of a car. It's like cars are, you you might be able to to direct it down the road, but if you have no practice and you have no sense, you're probably going to crash. That's right. Um, That's the... The, the book I just finished is called Bewusstseinskultur, which translates badly as a culture of consciousness. And what we are really lacking is like an ethical stance where we don't ask what is a good action, but ask what is a good state of consciousness. And uh, what states of consciousness do have good consequences also for the common good, for other people, for mental health, which ones will self-enforce them in the future. I mean, there are a lot of people, for instance, thinking about for a long time about introducing secular meditation training in schools, in in the general uh, education system. And there are a lot of things. There's, for instance, the Mind Foundation in Germany. A lot of people who think about enculturating some, carefully enculturating some aspects of the psychedelic experience. But it's really, it's it's an uphill battle, you know. As soon as this, you must have noted this, there are now all these large investors. People have a feeling, you know, uh, uh, this, this bizarre what has happened 
to the psilocybin world, you know, people are fighting for patents and, and markets and stuff. Immediately that takes over. And the simple question would be, I mean, what do we, which states of consciousness do we want to show our children? Uh, which states of consciousness do we want to die in? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. What state of consciousness would you actually like to die in? We actually think about it all the time. <laughs> 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 no, but maybe you, maybe you can answer the question. question. Well, like I always think... <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about it yesterday. Actually. I mean, like I think about it all the time because like we actually we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary uh, yesterday? No, the day, day before, before yesterday. And yeah, I'm always, but I'm always like the best case scenario is that w we die together, together <laughs> in some kind of fiery, very quick accident, best case scenario. But like the alternative is that you have somebody who you lose and you just are, are like left hollowed out wandering the planet, like knowing that it's just, it's gone. And so I don't know. I'm, I, I'm yeah. more. I want to hear your ideas about what the best states of consciousness are and how we train yeah. ourselves towards those. Well, this is a long story, and I have a lot of things to say about that. Uh, Let's hear it. Yeah, go for just, it. Just to tell you, we're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary next September. Congratulations! And, uh, it's a little closer to us. We're thinking about it too, and as of course all the beautiful things it brings into your life, it's the most dangerous form of attachment to. Uh, and you just, I mean, I've seen this, if you've seen people turn into widows after 60 years, like say my mother, after 60 years of a marriage, what that means, you know, it's, uh, you can go to Switzerland, you know, if you want to, there are these specialized hotels <laughs> and you can lie in a bed together. Uh, but, Hopefully that's still some some time away, uh, you know. But I think many people have this thought that they are so attached uh, to each other that they would go like to go together. And of course, in most countries of the world, that's illegal. That's not an option you have, by the way. Nobody will help you with that project. You will have to find illegal drug dealers to solve that problem. In the state. No doctor will help you uh, with that. And in the countries where they are helping people, it seems like corruptions are popping up like whack-a-mole. You just can't even knock them down. Like, what was this? Yeah. Oh, I, I think that there's a, a medically assisted dying program in Canada, which seems to be being used as a mechanism for people that are difficult for society to help to basically remove themselves from society. It's like people who are sick, uh -huh. people who are homeless, people who, if they had social services and they had some kind of safety net, might be able to get back on their feet. But there's there's a whole industry that's that's coming up around helping people die and making it a consumerist culture and making profits off of it and it's just that's what we do right that's like that's part of the program right now which hopefully will be able well, to solve down the line you know i'm a professional philosopher and i've worked in applied ethics and on assisted suicide and what was most convincing to me as an argument one day i talked to a doctor who was strictly against you know um active uh, euthanasia in germany and the option and and i mean i know all the philosophical arguments back and forth you can get very theoretical about it but he said you don't know what is happening in ordinary country hospitals you how many mistakes are made per week, you know, wrong medical decisions. And another thing is you don't have my life experience. You don't know how it is if you're on a corridor and these relatives come and say, um, uh, we wanted to talk about granny with you one more time. Uh, uh, we have booked these flights, you know, in the, for a holiday in three weeks. And um, uh, do you think you could arrange somehow and uh, some doctors have a very different reality uh, uh, with unbelievable emotional pressure or situations with relatives. Um, and I say there is, there's a risk that a dam might break, you know, and there might be real risk, uh, real victims of a development like that. 
because it's it's not only people who are difficult for society, it's old people who feel they are a burden to their children. Um, that's called indirect coercion, you know, all this kind of stuff. You need great safety measures. But on the other hand, I, as a free citizen in a free society, I want to have the full right to decide, decide on my own end. And that's my right. It's my life. And it, my, my end, my death belongs to me, you know, and not to some lawyers and to the state. And I would also like people to help me. I mean, they also help me if I catch a cold or so. Um, and what I see is that many people wait too long with decisions of that kind and then get demented before they can do anything, they slide into a situation. Everybody else doesn't have the courage. Their children don't have the courage, you know, and then you have these prolonged situations which uh, in which there's a lot of suffering going on. So... Bewusstseinskultur, a culture of consciousness, would also mean to have a new culture of dying. And there, there are a lot of practical problems to be solved. Like how, say, if you wanted to go together, and not because one of you has cancer, but because you're grown up mentally healthy people at the age of 74, and you say, we want to go where we have no depression and no dementia. As free citizens, we want to go. Um, I think, I don't know if that's the right English word, but the state has a duty of care uh, for you. I mean, you're taxpayers to help you to die in the way you want to die and not let you, you know, do something dangerous yourself. <laughs> end with a bad trip. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so messy. Like if you think about like if you think about that case, there's so few conditions where it's possible to do that without making a mess. And somebody has to find your body and somebody has to deal with yes. your body. Yes. It's so traumatizing yes. and it's horrific and you know, it could be violent or bloody or, or just yes. like and we don't we don't live in a society where we deal with bodies a lot, right? Like we we never see dead bodies. It's also the aspect of youth too, right? Um, when, when something you were talking about earlier made me think of this as well, where uh, I think it was young people in psychedelic or, or people going to the raves, right? And, and taking these substances to these unbelievable levels. It's that the, the human brain hasn't fully developed until people are, what, like 27 or something? No, 23. 23 okay, okay, yeah. okay. But, but still, but, yeah. Right, you look at, I don't know, like I had a, one of, someone I grew up with killed themselves uh, at the height of their, you know, right after we all went all the way to college. And it was just like completely devastating to everybody in the community. And I think what was devastating about it was just that, this person hadn't lived long enough to make this appraisal of their whole life. Like it was, there's something about, about the ability to rebirth yourself, right? Like, of course, when something tragic happens to you when you're 18, you could have a whole nother identity after that. You could be a totally new person. And that's not a situation that plays out when you're 75 or something. Right. So, yes. so I think that the age factor and, and the developmental factor really tilts the argument and people, lose that nuance and, and wrap it all into one bundle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely right. Yeah. So what are the best states of consciousness? Um, as I've said in that little book, I've tested many of them, but one thing you may not be aware of, I'm also a long-term practitioner of meditation, so I've meditated at least twice a day for 46 years. I've been to places, silent retreats, India, and all that. And um, I think in the end, the bottom line is, is um, that that cluster, that region of phenomenal state space uh, that is caused, that, that you can enter through a regular and sustained meditation practice is the most valuable of all uh, because it's, um, uh, I like the right word, I mean, for normal people, dramatic psychedelic experiences are very hard 
to digest and to productively integrate because there's no cultural context. There are some people who are very strong, who make something out of it and it actually works and it's beautiful and it enriches their lives. But for, I think for the sustainable is the word I was looking for. So I think for the general population and for a large scale approach, a regular meditation practice is much more sustainable than introducing, say, the psychedelic experience on a, a larger scale. Um, because there we would need many more things, um, which we don't have, you know, beautiful places, protected environments trained trip sitters and mm. therapists and all that. We don't, don't have that infrastructure. So I think it's not a very brilliant idea to simply legalize mushrooms or LSD. I, I one time had very a, intelligent. You know. I, I one time had a very strong psychedelic experience on a city bus in San Francisco. And that was a very, it was, you're totally right about the set and setting just being missing from most urban environments. Like there's nowhere to go where you can like sit peacefully. You're just kind of jostled constantly by, by, by society. And the city bus in San Francisco is a terrifying place. for. Well, for cities in general are, can just be this crazy dichotomy between the absolute bottom of of society and the absolute top. And it's just this really yeah. polar, I mean, even not having a psychedelic experience going, we live out in the beautiful country, but going to the city can be just almost psychedelically jarring in that way where yeah. you just see a guy just like, you know, peeing in his shoe or something over here. And then there's like this temple uh, to technology. Yeah. Down the or like, you know, like a, a Ferrari drives by or something, and yeah. you know it's. Uh, but what does your own practice look like? What What have you found over the years works best so that you're able to, you know, find the space and time and place to do that? Well, you know, if you do this for your whole life, this is also, of course, a long journey, and and things change. You try different techniques, but. I've done the very classical vipassana for most of my life, but if you do these things, then other things become um, interesting too, like Dzogchen or Mahamudra practice. There are these micro meditations during the day. There's a very good American teacher called Loch Kelly. I don't know if you know him. He calls this glimpsing. So just briefly make contact, and but not try to make it a continuous state during the day. There are all kinds of other things that it may have to do with sleep and dreams. Uh, if you're interested in this, you of course will, you will naturally try out more and more things and adapt your practice. But I think just straight, very classic uh, Vipassana. This is also, we have just published, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, a large psychometric study about the pure awareness experience in meditators in, from 57 countries. Mm. And you see from our data, you see that Vipassana is just simply the most practiced technique all over the world right now. Classical insight meditation. Um, what was this thing about the dreams? That's I, I'm really fascinated by dreams. How, how is that tied into well, this? Well, if you look at the experience of pure awareness, there's something that is technically called a pure, a full absorption episode. Um, that is when you completely melt just into the experience of aware does, doesn't mean it's something tra uh, dramatic in any way but that the only thing you can later report is being have, having been aware of awareness itself the quality of awareness itself if you look at this scientifically there are basically three ways of entering um, um, a full absorption episode one is from the waking state sitting on a cushion very classical another thing is in very advanced and rare practitioners what is called clear light sleep or witnessing sleep some people have a stable pure awareness experience during non-REM sleep during dreamless deep sleep and then there is something that has also been known for centuries um, but is practiced very rarely is to enter from a lucid dream like um, 
if you are able to have a stable lucid state in the dream state, then dissolve all of that dream reality and just enter pure awareness from there. Uh, so these are the three main entry routes. And there is, for example, if you think what is the easiest one, there is a, an excellent, truly excellent uh, young dream researcher in America, Benjamin Baird in Wisconsin, who has the idea that actually entering from a lucid dream is the easiest and fastest way to do that than meditating a lot in waking consciousness. And it might be interesting to tra train dream lucidity to a much larger um, extent to be able to enter that state from there. Mm. Um, I don't know if any of that is of interest. Oh, yeah. I, how, do you, how do you do that? <laughs> like, how like do you lucid dreaming? Yeah, have you had experience with this? And well, I have a, a little more sober. Uh, so I've been, been extremely interested in lucid dreams. Already in my early twenties, I've built my own machines and slept with headphones. And at that time, you had audio cassettes, and I made my own. You know, with what's the thing to take off nail, pol nail polish with mm, acetone? acetone yeah. You can make endless tapes with acetone <laughs> and had my own endless tapes that every few minutes would just say in my headphones, watch out, this is a dream. I did lots of experiments. Um, I had um, lucid dreams in my 20s. I almost have never have any right now. And Maybe there is a less romantic story to be told. There are some scientific data that shows that lucid dreaming frequ frequency actually peaks at the age of 17 mm. and then slowly goes down. And there are some speculative ideas I've heard that it has with to do with the process. You just mentioned brain maturation, that it is actually uh, an intrusion of the wake state into REM sleep. That is happening because the juvenile brain isn't fully maturated, right? Right. Yeah. And that, that may be one reason why it goes away after 23, 25, mm. but that's all highly speculative. But I've done a lot of research on that, but that was mainly 25 years ago. Um, I mean, one thing that plagues me. You know, I mean, who would be interested in virtual reality and the metaverse? Who would be interested in that if we could become stable lucid dreamers? How ridiculous this technology, you know, how ridiculous. Coarse crane, <laughs> crashes, <laughs> doesn't work. I mean, Makes you dizzy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot to be said about the biological basis of these states of consciousness that people seek elsewhere. But the difference is the fact that it's really hard to train yourself to be a repetitive meditator. And it's really easy to put on that headset. And it's really easy to take the pill. It's really easy to take some other option. And I, 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 this goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, where there's some fraction of people that want to fill out the 300 question questionnaire for democracy because they believe <laughs> that that's how it should function. And then others are just like, no, nah, it's good. I, I'm cool. And, and yeah. so it seems like we'll always. It's, uh, personally, I think of it's a speciation event. I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there is a type of human that will descend into the technosphere and then there is a type of human that will insist on remaining organic and because you talk about the acceptance of death and you talk about the the taking care of your conscious states some people will will do everything they can to escape death and to make sure that they live for yes. forever that is also a very interesting point what part of us, of us is it that doesn't want that you know, for instance, to come briefly back to, to psychedelics over many years, I have learned if, say, young people ask for advice, I think one good advice is if you are scared and if you don't want to do this, don't do this. 
Nobody has to justify themselves for being scared of tripping. And never do this because all your friends do this. Or you want somebody to like you. Because the fact that you are really scared, this may be one part of your system that knows there is a deep trauma there. Uh, and uh, that you may have to confront that and feel all that pain or something. Um, you know, there's this, the, the, one of the more subtler things in Buddhist practice also is self-compassion. And what you can do with psychedelics, for instance, is self-traumatize, you know. Uh, yeah, you want to belong to the cool people too, you're in love with that girl, then you do something you know is actually risky, and then you're on for 12 hours. And you have to look at these things that you didn't want to look at because you never had a serious interest in the first place <laughs> of turning this to into something therapeutic mm. <laughs> or something like that or you know uh, go into all this pain and and this uh, trauma so i think those people who say no i just want to get drunk in front of youtube and i don't want to become more aware one shouldn't discard this maybe they have good reasons uh, why they think they don't want this, why they sense a risk there. One has to see every individual um, case. And of course, maybe what you mentioned is just because so many people have been hurt by life so much already that you don't want to lose control. Mm, you know, I think that's there. exactly what it's about. And and so many people, it's funny because you see a schism between people who prefer alcohol versus cannabis, at least in this country. And it's interesting because the people who don't like cannabis will usually say something like, it makes me paranoid or it makes, yeah, that's usually what you hear. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly what it does. <laughs> that's exactly what it does. It's, gonna, it's exactly what it does. And it's like, if you don't, want that difficult experience if you don't embrace the difficulty of having to stare at the ugly parts of yourself and actually work them out you're gonna you're gonna lose your mind you know it's and so it's it's a little bit tragic because i feel like some of the people that could benefit from that the most are the people that are the most averse to it as well and since there's not really a good cultural context to exp like the safe place that we were talking about right um it doesn't end up being an experience that a lot of people will subject themselves to. You know, they, they tried it once at a party one time and they spent the whole night freaking out about how stupid they sounded or something, you know, and, and they'll, they'll never come back to it. There's I also, miss it. Yeah. yeah. Th there's also an aspect, which is that when you are in a... If you're in a dead end and you take a substance that forces you to look at the dead end that you have basically navigated yourself into mm -hmm. that substance gives you two options you look at it and you either come to terms with that this is where you are or you want to change it and i think that for a lot of people the the thing that is missing is the toolkit for being able to change it mm. like you imagine exactly. Right, somebody who's in a in a bad career, or somebody who's in a bad relationship, or somebody who lives in a country that's being bombed all the time. Like, you take a substance that makes you aware of the situation, and you're just like, "Well, this sucks. I can't do yeah, anything." Of course, about it. and you're right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the worst part. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of excellent initiatives in Sweden, in Germany, going on. The whole point is integration. So what we actually don't have as a cultural tradition and what has to be um, trained from scratch uh, is, um, I think in English one would say facilitators for the integration process. Like everybody can drop something. The real big work comes afterwards, in the days afterwards, and what you make of it, and will you make something out of it? And uh, of course, most of it, us don't want to make something out of it. <laughs> they want to go somewhere else. And by the way, I have the same, have confronted the same problem a number of times 
coming out of a long silent meditation retreat mm. um, and sitting in a train back home and having a very hard come down, you know, uh, and being very disappointed uh, that this evaporates within 48, 72 hours and that I'm just not to man maintain the beauty and all the insights uh, from real life. So th the transition, the integration into everyday life, that's the real thing. And uh, the problem, I think, for many people also is that the don't have the right circle of friends. It's very hard. You know, one thing you shouldn't do is do this if there's a strong voice in you that says, I, I'm scared. I'm just do this because I want these people to be my friends, you know, uh, or something like that. Another thing you shouldn't do is do it with people where you haven't properly thought about if you want to be with, together with these people uh, when something like this happens, how many strangers are there? Whom do you really trust? You know, uh, because, as you know, if there are some weird people, <laughs> you don't really know, um, that can escalate very quickly. So in a hostile cultural environment, where this wisdom isn't present, where the institutions aren't present. Um, it needs really good and compassionate circle of friends. And mm. this is easier said than done in my experience. You know, you can see the need, but then do you have these people that will help you in the integration process? Or One thing I found is... Uh, really useful with this is art and I, and I don't mean like art so that you can sell it to people or make make it a profession or anything but uh, the act of engaging in creative experiences under the, these meditative or uh, just altered states let's say allows you to have a means of bringing that back to the world with you ideally mm -hmm. um, I think that if you practice you can make things that will bring that you can bring to other people and share what you've learned and really just bring to yourself even if you're not sharing it with other people if you make uh, if you're able to write or or make paintings or music or something that allows you to take that experience back into the normal uh, non-altered world I think that it, it's, it allows you to be able to preserve that experience in a way and ideally share it with other people and, and, and sort of cling on to some of the wisdom longer than you might be able to if it was just a memory per se yeah exactly but the thing is because we haven't developed that cultural context you know LSD has been around since 1943, 16th of April. Mushrooms have been around for millennia. And Western societies have miserably failed, you know, miserably failed <coughs> of creating this. And this may backfire because all the things the two of you have described may also happen to people returning from advanced VR uh, environments, you know, mm -hmm. give this technology another five or 10 years. It's going to be really cool. You know, I was in this five year EU, um, research project. I've been to 11 VR labs in different countries and seen this. There's a lot of very cool young scientists at this. They're improving everything. Um, you know, there are these smart kids in China and everywhere. You will very soon have like high definition avatars, which are photorealistic. You have them now, actually. And speech synthesis, you, you know, you can have Joe Biden give any speech with his own voice that he wants to give. You could have a Joe Biden avatar uh, declare a first strike on Russia now and have it go viral on the Internet. Mm -hmm. The technology is there. So you will have also have people coming back from the metaverse, from virtual reality, from some deep fake environment. And they may have the same problems as meditators coming home after an intense silent retreat or somebody who has a trip on the weekend and needs to go to work again. You know, they, there's no integration for that experience. Uh, we don't have a have the wisdom. 
and the culture for it somehow. I think to pull on what what Shiloh said, we had a conversation about mindfulness meditation with uh, Joe Arpaia and uh, Labsang Rapke, who's at UCLA, and he's a he was actually a, a Tibetan monk for many years, and he was talking about something really interesting that they did a big pilot study of mindfulness meditation for for school kids. And they found that it doesn't really work because the kids don't practice it. They're bored. Mm -hmm. And Shiloh's comment about art as being this the, the context for a beautiful meditative practice makes a lot of sense because if you have a strong art education for kids, you uh -huh. can train uh. that space for people where they, they have a vibrant way of of contextualizing these experiences that a, doesn't have to be commercial either that that's doesn't, a, like, yeah. i literally don't know what i would do without music i really don't like i think i would be a complete nut job without music because it's just a place where i can i know that i know what i'm doing i can it's all my own it's a place where i can develop these wisdoms that i i achieve in my other experiences and i just don't know how people survive without it i really oh. don't i really oh. don't I, but there's congratulations <laughs> you've got something <laughs> yeah he did. It's, it's incredible but i think but, but everybody can, i really believe that everybody can have something like that i don't think that it has to be about becoming a professional artist or a professional musician or anything like that i really think that there's a private place for that in everyone's life that would that go go so far but art education is, it's a bifurcating path, right? So I don't know how it is in Germany, but in the United States, most schools have, they've cut a uh, choir, they've cut art, they've cut woodworking, they've cut all of these uh, craft practices mm. that people used to have that were so integral to them. Like the, 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 yeah, so meditative the, the work of the artisan who's making, you know, somebody who, who wood carves and makes a spoon or makes little figurines or something is just as effective as somebody who makes yeah. music to channel that. And we, and that's being eroded because it's not a productive skill. And education is something that makes people productive for industrial applications. At the yeah, end of the you day. You see, that's the whole thing with this whole Mac mindfulness thing. You have new generations of MBSR teachers and the corporate world knows that this is good for their employees. And about the children. So you see, my wife is a documentary uh, filmmaker and she's made one big cinema movie um, about different approaches from children from four years old to 16 year old with meditation in school. And one completely, also scientifically, completely unresolved issue is what is the right time window for what technique? And I thought it was so interesting what you said about music and painting because I've been saying this in the public that we have to introduce secular meditation practice in society, that it's about the best thing we can do. But I've always said, I don't want the religion teacher to get a hold of this. I rather think the sports teacher should do it. Mm. I've never had the idea that you just had the arts teacher. You know, uh, I mean, that's... Uh, that's actually a very good idea. It might also be in certain ages for children. Uh, I think just mindful. yeah, just the idea of embracing art as a meditation as opposed to as this productive thing, right? That's going to be your career and your com you know your commercial output and all of this. That people can carve out a space for that that has nothing to do with productivity in the classical sense. Because sport fades from our lives as we leave childhood like how many adults do you know that are part of a sport like a team league? sport yeah yeah like i because i um i had a really weird upbringing where we were immigrants in the united states and uh my my uh my dad was very yeah. I, from the soviet union okay and we actually had a long path we went soviet union israel canada to the united states and so it was like very mm -hmm. tumultuous for the first 10 years but uh, my dad was hyper isolationist, like no clubs, no sports. My sister did band for a while, but he hated having to drive her in the mornings. So he gradually like well, he was very that. allergic to the American culture, right? Yeah, he was worried that this was like a way that America would steal our Russianness from us, and it very well ah. might have. It, you know, like I'm sure that it would have. 
<laughs> but as an adult, I'm like, man, it would be cool to be on a team. But there's not really adult team sports. There's not really a way to be. And I can engage in sport by myself. Like I can go running, I can lift weights, I can climb. But there isn't mm-hmm. the same the the same vessel for it as there is for art because all that requires is a piece of paper or a guitar or or a, a pen. Like that's that's all that you mm-hmm. need. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's so easily accessible and you can carry it with you always and I just I think that it's everyone has a creative desire to output, but everybody's afraid that they won't be able to make something that's good that they can share yeah. with people. But it's like it's so internal. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, this uh, it's nasty, you know, um, the time pressure of professional life and the sacrifices uh, people have to make. I think all of this has been said a million times by different people in different ways. And if you don't actively resist um, somehow, I mean, you will kill all these things in yourself or they will just wither away. You know, I just retired uh, on 1st of April, um, five years ahead of time. And I now look back on the insanity of a, an academic career and this is, is interesting i mean you sacrifice a lot of things um, we didn't have children but one thing i just cannot understand how my friends made it with children mm. and a family um, that degree of competitiveness of nastiness you know of constant competition and of course, it leaves you with a lot of damage. So something I'm facing now after retirement is, is that my brain algorithms have learned something over 30 years. This is, I always have much more to do than I can manage. I am in a hurry. The default state is to be in a hurry as a full professor at a university with examinations and everything uh, you have to do. It's very difficult to unlearn this now. <laughs> it's an automatic. I am in a hurry, man. <laughs> you know, you, you train your brain for 30 years uh, just by this input and um, you will have trouble. Um, you can get addicted to the satisfaction of having achieved a lot or having had a good working day um, and all these things. It's just like heroin. I, I see people die from it. I don't know if you've seen those people who are retired for more than 10 years and still make total fools of their se- themselves in their 70s because they just cannot stop this thing, you know. Uh, this busyness thing and this productivity drug, you know, that made them stop sports and art long ago. (laughs) But now that they're retired, they're still being eaten alive Mm -hmm. by all the stuff um, the system has put into them. For instance, ambition. It's a really nasty thing, you you know, or... Uh, a really nasty thing that natural evolution has invented is a sense of self-worth. You know, um, yeah. how can you be a mindful artist and be happy doing crappy things nobody wants to look at, <laughs> but present, pre- preserve your sense of self-worth? You know, because it's so coupled. To you have that. to really find something that just gives you pleasure to do it. That's the that's the thing about art. It's like you you have to find something that you would you just love do. That time just evaporates. You know that you can just get you know pick up that pencil or like whatever it is that you do and just be there and like love it. And who cares like what comes? You have to really just be okay with making terrible works of art as well it, it, because you, you have to divorce yourself from from the productivity side of it versus the creative side of it and that's very i think for professional artists they suffer the most because they're inevitably pegged to their survival or sorry their their creative product is pegged to their survival um, sure. but uh, you know people don't have to do that with their lives as well you can you can do things artistically that are completely divorced from your everyday life. Mm. 
I want to tell yeah, you. Yeah, but you have to find somebody to pay you for it somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, maybe, you know. And that, that's kind of the premise that I think in terms of, you know, mass unemployment and universal income, I can imagine a world where instead of a dystopic, you know, mm. aggressive world that develops, people return to these things that they love to do and they have the time to form communities and they have the time to practice art and they have the time to be separated from their need to produce. And if you want to do something that you're going to get paid more for, then by all means, but to remove that pressure, because I don't think that humans evolved under the pressure of, I have um. to go to a job and to produce work for somebody else. Humans evolved under the pressure that you see in animals, right? I think about this. Animals are constantly under the pressure of, I have to provide for myself. But there's there's an end to that to some degree. On a good year, the squirrel has enough acorns and it can spend time playing and mating and enjoying the world. Like there's all these videos of uh, bears that they'll sometimes go and they'll just sit and look at vistas. It's just like, you know, you just have a bear on a hillside and it's like looking at a sunset. And I think that those tendencies that we have are not just human tendencies. They're animalistic tendencies that have been maintained through our evolution. That I must just look up a word uh, in my German-English leisure. Yeah, You mm. just have the word leisure. Uh, we've lost that. You know, um, I mean, also because of the devices in our hands, they prevent leisure. You know, um, there was a really interesting study the other day that, again, I didn't read it too deeply. I skimmed it, but it was talking about how social media addiction uh, makes people less creative. Mm -hmm. And I think that what it really is doing is it's interrupting people's ability to enter into a flow state. Yeah, you get addicted to these micro depletions of dopamine. I think there's a probably a nuts and bolts story to be told about it. It has to do, I think, with novelty stimuli, uh, um, and you you feed on that. Uh, but it also has um, something to do with what Carl Fristen brilliantly has called epistemic foraging. We are all the time, we are all the time foraging for a nice little surprise, a novelty stimulus in these extended uh, environments. And we are overeating and we are a part of us as obese, but we just somehow feel something is wrong. I don't know, it's just, uh, we have a, we have a dic difficult uh, environment and, um, of course, for many people, if they hear us talking about leisure, it's it's ridiculous uh, under the economic pressures uh, under which they are. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's difficult for us. Even. <laughs> like, I, I also feel like I should be working all the time, you know? It's very difficult to break off that time to do something that's not directly pegged to survival in some sense, just because we're living so close to the edge, in a, you know? The prices are all going through the roof. Wages yeah. are going down. Um, uh -huh. it, it's not easy. Yeah, I wanted if I I've, I wanted to ask you how you felt about not having children. That is again a long story. Um, I made this decision very early on. Um, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, so obvious. Um, uh, that I wouldn't even argue for it uh, with empirical data or something, that an ordinary average human life um, contains much more suffering than joy. And uh, uh, it's pretty obvious that there is an enormous amount of wild animal suffering on the planet. There are 60 billion animals in factory farming that suffer for meat consumptions on the planet and 8 billion people, and I think, so I've thought a bit about suffering and the minimization of suffering uh, too, and it's pretty obvious uh, that you can treat this on many levels, like we are anti-entropic systems, you know, we 
resist the general strategy of the universe for a certain time by sustaining our existence, but we are fighting this absolutely unwinnable um, um, uphill battle on the level of our bodies, you know, and this, of course, carries over into um, our minds. And I think we have evolved many self-deception mechanisms mm, that makes us turn a blind eye. Many people think if you say there's more suffering uh, than joy in life, they think, no, they think of dramatic suffering. But if you... Um, just look at non-dramatic suffering of moment by moment by moment. There's this little fullness in your stomach and there's this little boredom or this very faint existential despair that comes in a little bit. We got used to it. Um, most of our suffering is non-dramatic and I once... I made a pilot study, which I never could turn into a real experiment with about 15 very brilliant young philosophers. And it's called, um, it's also about your suicide. Um, it's called the eternal playlist experiment. So the idea is there will be life after death, but you can only make new experiences before death. Mm. And then you can take those you want to choose into your eternal playlist. And then there will in eternity, those states of consciousness you take with you into the after um, life, they will be replayed to you with a random function. And um, then we did something, somebody programmed an SMS server so that everybody got 10 random stimuli on their mobile phone per day. And the question, the task was, when that buzzes, the last moment, the last moment you had, would you take that with you into the afterlife? And um, then you lose about, this is called experience sampling. And there's a very interesting man, Russ Hurlbert in the US, who's doing that. Um, and then you find, okay, they missed 30 um, cues. So in the end, after one week, we had about 70 samples. And it was very interesting. So I asked these young people, so um, how many good moments did you have? Moments that were livable in the sense that you would like to take them into the afterlife with you or relive them again. And then the average, I think, was eight out of 70 mm. samples. And my two by far smartest people in the group were a little embarrassed and didn't want to say something, but because they had zero as a result. And there was one guy who was playing in a rock band, and he has the highest number of happy moments, but he had a problem with his girlfriend um, because she realized this thing buzzes. I'm hanging out with him on the on the couch and he doesn't make a note. They realized all of his happy eternal life moments are not moments when his girlfriend is present. So they had developed a little relationship problem. And, and I said, so what are you? You're the most positive, happy person in this group. What are your most uh, positive moments? And he says, it's when I play with my band and rip up the amp really. Now, oh, that's when I'm really happy, you know, playing with my two friends. And I think if we were to not have a theory about, oh, yeah, but I have an interesting life and I'm writing an interesting PhD thesis, I make a contribution to mankind and have an interesting podcast and everything. If we were like Buddhists to look at this moment by moment, we would discover really that most of it is really deeply unsatisfactory um, and that we wouldn't take it with us in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, so to make a long story short, of course, there are these philosophical discussions in philosophy that's called antinatalism. Mm -hmm. There are some people over the centuries who've said that you shouldn't bring new human beings into existence. 
But there's a case to be made that one really shouldn't recklessly uh, create new human beings if one hasn't solved the problem of suffering in one's own life. You know, uh, um, this is a this is a very large step to have a child. It's a very large step. And um, one interesting argument I've only heard two years ago was one should never do something without very good reason that causes another human being to die. And if you're having a child, you do exactly that. You decide for somebody whom you don't know yet, who doesn't exist yet, that they will have to die at some point. And they will, you don't, they will never be asked if they want to be born. Uh, like in this Laurie Anderson song, and they will never be asked if they, you, none of us will ever be asked, are we ready to die now? You know, and you just put this on a new human being, the possibility that they will not want to die and will have to, you know, you just decide it like that because you want to have your bourgeois little thing, your little, you know, family stuff that you were conditioned. Um, uh, and so I think one should be very careful, but I'm also, I'm aware that these are not discussions you can have in the public. Mm. Like um, this will create enormous irritation and hatred in many audiences. And I think the reason is very simple because it, goes against the whole force of biological evolution. I mean, if anybody would ever seriously argue for antinatalism, I mean, you, you, you're picking a fight with an enemy <laughs> that is just too big for you. And the effect is that in most audiences, many people will get a very strong gut feeling and an intuition, this isn't right. Um, I don't know what this person is saying with their science or their philosophical arguments, but this is sick. You know, if it results in refraining from having children, it's just sick. It's dangerous. That's a feeling that many people will get. But still, I mean, do you think human existence is something that is worth having? Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely, for sure. Although you could have, you know, I've had, like, it probably depends like what day or of the year you ask me that to some extent, you know, we've definitely had some hard times this year and every year, but I think on balance for sure. Um, I mean, I, I, maybe it's my, my Soviet upbringing, but I've always thought that the suffering is an important part of being alive and there is beauty in it. And yeah, that there is fantastic ideology, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's it's like death is a part of life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember finding out. I actually remember learning that I was going to die for the first time, and I don't think I ever totally got over it to some extent. I literally remember walking down the street in my own neighborhood, like contemplating that for the first time, like whoa. And then, I, then my next thought was like, oh, that's a long ways away. Like, <laughs> don't worry about it. But it is a very, it, it is a a scar that I don't think we ever totally get over. It's but always that's a very. I think this is a super important point you are just mentioning. So human children usually comprehend this between seven and nine. And I also still knew this. I was a little philosopher at the age of eight. And I went down to my parents' dinner table crying bitterly. And they told me exactly the shit you just said. But it's a long time away. You know, they didn't get it. They tried to comfort me with all this nonsense of, but you're just a little boy and healthy. They didn't get, get it. You know, they were just offering me repression and distraction. And of course, that is one thing that connects us all, you and me, and that is very special about the human condition. I think very few other animals have an explicit representation of their own mortality. I mean, they have inklings and they go places. 
Well, they have avoid they have avoidance, you know, like they're certainly not going to rush towards anything that's going to kill them, but they don't have to contemplate. Like that's what's so bizarre about death is that it, it's always it's getting closer and closer to you. The more we, honestly the even the happier you I found, the more comfortable I am with my own life, the more I work out about my own relationship to the world, basically the more comfortable I get in the world, the more I'm confronted by the fact that it's all just going to disappear one day. And it's just like this unbelievable schism in my experience of the universe. I'm just, I just often feel like, how is that? That's so unfair. It's like, how can that be the case? Like I've just once, you know, I imagine by the time I'm, you know, ripe and 70 or 80 or whenever it is that I'll hopefully live to, I'll have figured everything out finally. I'll be like, I get it. I understand the world. I know how to do this. And then it's just over. (laughs) All for yeah. all for not, which and is everything will be like it was before. Which is why looking. art is so important <laughs> again, because <laughs> you can actually you can make something that that will be there for for uh-huh. beyond that that time. I think there's an immortality. Have you that. ever heard of terror management theory? Mm-mm. It's a disputed psychological theory which says that people like you who are creative and uh, generate cultural value and art are actually managing death anxiety by doing so by trying to create something permanent or having an ideology that's something that's greater than there's a whole research stream and there are some things that are really baffling. If you read up their reviews papers, 30 years of terror management paper uh, theory, say you would be a really staunch communist, right? And you would be a Buddhist, but that would be your life guiding ideology. And um, I would be a Catholic. And then one would measure with questionnaires how strongly we believe in our ideological construct. And then one brings a coffin into the room and just puts a coffin right here or takes us to a graveyard and you do the same questionnaire again and each of us is a much more devout Buddhist, a much more committed communist. Uh, The attachment to our ideological framework um, increases when what these scientists call mortality salient information <laughs> and that's the scene <laughs> you know uh, that's when you think art is really important <laughs> i think ch- having children for some people is that project is uh, for most people probably is that project as well it is that chance at making something that will live on beyond you it, it is a, an escape hatch from the mortality conundrum i think that plays yes, hugely into the psychology of it um, not so much that people are, I mean, certainly people are fascinated with or captivated by just living out their bourgeois fantasy or like the impressions that they were given about their suburban life that they should be moving towards. But there's something very appealing about the idea that you get a second chance in your children. And I mean, who wants to get born because of some people? <laughs> having problems like that you know yeah i mean is it's their self-healing strategy uh, or whatever it is and you have to live this life yeah my dad was always really open about that he was like we had you to take care of us when we grow old it's like that's <laughs> the function of children i just remember always being like i don't know that i i'm like i'm open to the idea but i don't know that i agree <laughs> to that <laughs> i'm like you could probably ask but yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot to think about here, and we've we've kept you for quite some time. Oh yeah, I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were talking about completely different things, like neuroscience, cognitive science, and AI. <laughs> and <laughs> all, all the more reason to get you back here one day and uh, continue with those ideas as well. <laughs> yeah. But you have a few books out. Um, we'll try to to put links to those down below so that people can check them out. Um, What's next? So, What's yeah? Go ahead. What is more important? Two things. You're going to see two books in the English language next year. So, one thing I should really mention: there is a book with the MIT Press, which will take the bad news. It will is it will take till October, and <clears throat> it tries a minimal model explanation for consciousness. It's not a very academic book. And it presents 500 experiential reports where people describe pure awareness. 
there's a scientific background. I want a minimal model explanation for consciousness, and I want to find out what the simplest form of conscious experience is. And so we have gathered a lot of phenomenological data. So the bad news is that MIT book will take till October, but the good news is it will be freely available to the whole world. Mm. It will be in a new open access pro, uh, problem and program. And then there's a small book on Bewusstseinskultur, which is finished in German, but I don't know what this licensing department does and, uh, and who will publish it in English. But probably you see a small book and a big book, uh, in the, in English in the next year. And then, I don't know. You can find all my academic stuff on Google Scholar. And there is one popular science book called The Ego Tunnel in English with basic books. It's a bit outdated and uh, a bit streamlined and damaged uh, by American editors. <laughs> but you can, <laughs> you, you can still read it. Uh, <laughs> it. But that's like... 2009, but it has a lot of to do with avatars mm. and um, identifying with an avatar. Maybe you find that useful. Mm. Well, let's plan to have you back in October when the book is published. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First, you have to look into it. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming by today. It's been a real privilege to have yeah, you sh now, show your. What about your children? What about our children? Yeah, where are they? <laughs> uh, we have a cat. <laughs> so this podcast is a baby. Yeah, yeah. That's, I see. That's this. Yeah, that's the strange thing about being an artist is you can really find that, especially as a couple, being artists together and make working on this project together. Um, we also have a band together, so like we we've kind of found ways to build things in the world that aren't biological entities um i hope maybe we will have the chance to have children at some point but again it's like we are still taming our own suffering we're we live very thin here we eat a lot of peanut butter so uh, I, I don't know that it's a great place for a child yet <laughs> yeah eat your peanut butter johnny <laughs> just like it yeah so so what i have to do now before i say goodbye to you is go down to my two cats in the basement and put away all the food so the <laughs> raccoon doesn't come in at night and, and creates havoc. Uh, <laughs> That's what I will do now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Dr. Metzger. Yeah. Great pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.